uh, thank you all for coming to my talk. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Colin O'Brien. I'm a software security engineer working at Dropbox on their detection and response team. Uh, if you're not very familiar with detection and response, the very short summed up version of my job is that I am tasked with tracking suspicious behaviors across Dropbox's various environments. If something looks particularly bad, I'm going to spend some time scoping it out, figuring out the root cause. And then if it's actually an attacker or more likely our red team, I'm going to ensure that they've been completely removed from the environment. Uh, today what I'm going to be talking about is a project that I work on outside of work. So this is not affiliated with Dropbox. Uh, it's called Grapple. Uh, Grapple is an open source graph analytics platform that targets detection and response work. Uh, graph is kind of the key word there. I'm going to be talking about sort of a graph based approach to detection and response uh, from a higher level, as well as how Grapple leverages that to make a lot of the things that I do at my job a lot faster and more ergonomic. So before I jump into what Grapple is, let's just do a very quick overview of graphs. Uh, graphs are a data structure, just like a list, array, hash map. They hold onto information. Graphs are composed of nodes and edges. Uh, nodes are going to be, oh, shoot, is it not updating? OK, I'm going to do it like this. Cool. That, that should help. Uh, so nodes are um, entities or things, nouns, right? Uh, you could imagine a person maps very nicely to a node. Edges are going to be those lines in between them. They denote relationships between nodes. As an example, you might have two person nodes and an edge between them because they are friends. Uh, graphs are a really powerful data structure for a whole number of reasons. I think one of the easiest ways to demonstrate that is with a very empty, plain graph like this. right? There's no explicit labels. There's not a lot of data here. But even still, I can say a lot of interesting things about this graph. I can say things like the purple node has a relationship with the green and the blue node. And the green node has a relationship with the blue node. And the reason I can do this is because of a really great property of graphs where they encode information about relationships into their structure itself. That's going to make them a, a very powerful uh, visualization tool. But that same property is going to come up in a lot of different places. Okay, Graphs are, uh, they're out of sync here. Uh, graphs are a really powerful uh, data structure. So of course, all these different companies are leveraging them. Google's Knowledge Graph powers their search engine. Uh, Facebook's Graph API is what underlies all of their public APIs. Graphs are also leveraged in uh, things like TensorFlow uh, as part of the, the way that the representation of its computation is. So TensorFlow is a form of data flow programming, which means it executes as a graph. Uh, for context, TensorFlow is a machine learning library uh, that was able to power AlphaGo and defeat all the top Go board game players. And that was a, a really big deal when that happened. Graphs also tend to be very emergent. Uh, so BGP uh, and the internet right, is essentially a graph of routers communicating with each other, and packets sort of traverse that graph. And that just sort of sprung about. Given that all these companies are leveraging graphs for these different use cases, it makes a lot of sense uh, that uh, the security community has started paying more attention to them. A couple of years ago, John Lambert at Microsoft wrote a post about some of the areas where he sees graphs and security. In this post, Lambert makes a, a very bold claim. He states, defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. So long as this is true, attackers win. Lambert then goes on to give an example of this list and graph-based thinking. He talks about how when defenders are given a network to protect, uh, one of the first things they'll do is start creating lists, such as who are the domain admins, who are the uh, high-value users, what are the risky assets. Right? And from this work, they'll begin uh, prioritizing what they're going to do to defend that network. This is very different from how attackers go about doing their job. Attackers will gain a foothold on whatever asset they can actually get their hands on. Uh, they're going to leverage the capabilities of that asset, such as by dumping uh, credentials from memory using tools like Mimikatz. And then they'll begin abusing the trust relationships of your users and your network to move laterally across it. According to Lambert, this mismatch in approach is so fundamentally bad for defenders that we simply cannot get around it without a shift in thinking. At the end of Lambert's post, he has this quote. He says, manage from reality because that is the prepared defender's mindset. So I think if you, if you read that post and you think about what he's talking about and you try to get that, that fundamental reality, I think there is a more generalized concept here, which is that if you take information that fits really cleanly into one data structure, such as a graph, uh, and then you try to force it into another data structure, like a list, you lose information. You make certain operations less optimal. In this case, we're losing that 
that trust relationship information that a graph makes very clear, but a list completely removes. Uh, okay, that slide is dead. Uh, cool. Uh, Bloodhound is a tool uh, that I think has really managed to, um, let me, give me one moment, I'm gonna see if I can move this over. Yep, this is why I have two tabs open. Cool, so, ah, oh, this is the speaker view. Okay, I have three tabs open, just. <laughs> <laughs> Backups for my backups. Okay, cool. <laughs> I was very prepared. So uh, <laughs> I think Bloodhound is a really great demonstration of this graph-based approach. Uh, Bloodhound allows you to visualize your active directory structures so that you can move from a world where you do things like, um, say, who are my domain admins, and start asking questions like, what are the paths to my domain admin. And it does this by visualizing all of your Active Directory data as a, as a graph and letting you query it as a graph. So that's a really fundamental shift in how you do that work. It's a, it's a new capability altogether when you start thinking in that way. So in detection response, uh, sort of the fundamental primitive that we use for our work is the log. Logs are these digital representations of events across a network. What we do is we index billions and billions of these logs every single day, collecting them and storing them in what's called a SIM, which is effectively just a giant list of logs. And we'll search through that list of logs, trying to find suspicious behaviors. And if we find them, we go back to those other logs to pivot off them and get other behaviors, right? So everything is, is based on this log construct. Now, if you pull out a couple of logs, right, and you put them next to each other like I have here, uh, you can start to see that there's actually these implicit relationships between them, right? I can see that the parent PID in one log and the PID in another actually matches with a parent PID in a different log, right? When you start pulling these relationships out and turning them into graphs, it becomes very obvious what's going on. We're exposing not just the event in isolation, but we're telling a whole story about what's happening here. We're seeing those relationships, we're seeing those behaviors. So this is really what Grapple is all about. Uh, what Grapple aims to do is what a sim does with logs, Grapple wants to do with graphs. So your detection work, your response work, scoping, all of that's going to be graph-based. Grapple runs in an AWS account. Uh, so after you set it up, what you'll do is send it uh, some raw logs. Uh, Grapple supports Sysmon as well as a more generic JSON format that you can target. Uh, Grapple will do very much what we saw on that last slide. It's going to pull out a subgraph representation based on those logs, mapping things like PIDs to nodes. It'll perform some identification steps uh, because we want canonical identities. We don't want to think in PIDs. We want to think about you know, a, a node, uh, a process being a node as, as a self-contained, identifiable construct. Um, these identified subgraphs get merged into a giant master graph. So there's this graph database that's constantly in real time being updated, representing all the entities and behaviors across your network. As that master graph is being built and updated, Grapple will orchestrate the execution of your attack signatures, uh, or what Grapple calls analyzers. And those are going to perform a, a sort of pattern matching and query that master graph for suspicious behaviors. And finally, when enough analyzers go off and you decide that this is something you need to investigate, Grapple provides a tool called an engagement, and that's going to allow you to really quickly pivot across your logs and fully scope an attacker's behaviors. So I'm going to be going over how all of this works, um, sort of the graph-based fundamental uh, behind it, um, and, and just try to give you a high-level overview of what Grapple is able to do. So when I talk about that master graph, uh, I'm really talking about what you see here. At least today, uh, there are some core provided uh, graph abstractions. We have things like processes, files, external IP addresses, and connections to them, right? So we can represent all of these things in our graph today. In the very near future, uh, this should actually all work. It just has to go to master. Uh, I can do things like provide asset nodes as well as uh, internal network communication, which would be really great for lateral movement detections. Uh, beyond that, Grapple provides a dynamic node construct, which the plugin system uses. I'll go into that later, but uh, essentially you can just expand this graph uh, with plugins however you want. 
you can see that nodes are pretty standard. Processes have things like process names. Files have paths. And then there are these sort of special edges, these special properties, like a process has children or files that it's created, right? And those edges point to a list of other nodes. So this is, this is what Grapl is under the hood. So I mentioned that uh, there's an identification stage. Uh, this ends up solving a lot of really important problems that a log-based system will have. Uh, the two problems I run into with logs um, are that, uh, for one thing, PIDs, uh, those pseudo-identifiers, process IDs, they get reused. They're not actually really good identifiers. It's the same thing with file paths, right? If I create a file and delete it, and then you know, some attacker puts a file there, it's important to realize that those are two distinct entities. So uh, one thing that instrumentation tools like Sysmon uh, will provide is a process GUID construct. Uh, so you don't have to worry about PID collisions. You get true identity. Uh, but it doesn't solve the second problem I have, which is that when I want to understand some kind of construct like a process, I, I will search for that process GUID, right? And OK, no more uh, PID collisions. But I'm going to have to comb through tens or even hundreds of log lines just to understand what it's doing. There's tons of redundancy in between there. If you've seen a Sysmon log, probably 70% of that data is duplicated across every log. Uh, so what Grapple is going to do is much like Sysmon, it'll generate a canonical identifier for any logs that you send up, uh, not just Windows, but anything Grapple can uh, parse. Uh, and then it's going to coalesce all of the unique information into just one place, one node. right? And that canonical identifier is called a node key. I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, one method of identification, just so you can kind of internalize what this looks like. Um, this is session-based identification. Sessions are things like processes or files. Uh, they have a pseudo-identifier like a PID or a path, but it's only good for a period of time uh, when the process has started uh, all the way until it's ended. Right? The way Grapple solves uh, identification is it will look at logs like process creation or termination logs, and it'll start building up timelines for every pseudo-identifier for every asset. Here you can see that there's two process creation logs. Uh, and so we can say that PID 250 on this asset uh, has the ID 0 for the time span of 20 to 50. And then there was another process creation log. So we know that there must be a new entity from 50 to wherever that next log is. When this other log comes in, because the process has actually done something to find its identity, we just look it up in the timeline. Now keep in mind that Grapple is going to handle all of these crazy edge cases for you. Um, one obvious one is that uh, your instrumentation might start up after a lot of your processes have already started. So you'll never get those process creation logs. There's a lot of uh, heuristics and other work that goes into handling those cases. But this is the happy path, and this is what identification means in Grapple. All right, let's talk about detection. So log-based detection, I think, tends to drive us towards uh, properties or artifacts, right? We will look for hashes. Um, and we might even look for things like command line arguments. I think the command line argument example is a really, uh, really useful one, because command line arguments aren't actually interesting. Attackers can change them. They can use other binaries with different command line arguments or bring their own binaries, right? Uh, what we're using command line arguments for when we use logs to build rules is as a proxy for the underlying behavior. I don't care that you know, curl executes with dash f. I care that the attacker is sending a file off of the box. That's the foundation. And logs don't do a very good job of exposing those, those uh, core behaviors. On top of that, those sims, uh, the, the indexes, uh, kind of punish you for writing searches that have to look at more than one log at a time. Uh, so if I want to pivot in part of my rule going from uh, an execution log over to a network log over to something else, uh, the sim might actually just break if I try to do that. Uh, joining performance is, is generally something that uh, starts getting exponential very quickly. One demonstration of where this relationship-based rule uh, would be really helpful uh, is if we have these two logs here. Uh, these are just two process creation logs. One is for Word, and one is for PowerShell. Now, these are both uh, valid, digitally signed Microsoft binaries. They are almost certainly executing in the vast majority of environments. Yes, PowerShell is a tool that attackers like to use, uh, but so do system admins. And again, if we, if we put these logs next to each other, we can see that there is this implicit relationship, right? 
And when we turn this into a graph, I can see that it's not Word or PowerShell or any properties of those processes that I really want to build a rule around. It is the fact that Word is executing PowerShell. It is actually the hidden information that I care the most about in this case. And even more so, it's not Word and PowerShell uh, being, having that relationship. It's, it's really just the fact that there is a, uh, an assumption that two processes shouldn't have a relationship in this environment, right? So the more generalized structure-based query that we want to get to is tracking things like unique parent-child executions. When you start uh, designing your attacks as if they are graphs, I think the attack signatures become really obvious. Uh, we have uh, executions uh, of Word talking to uh, a non-whitelisted IP address, right? This is going to be kind of property heavy, uh, but the properties are more of an optimization to increase our sense of risk. We can also use uh, more generalized searches, like the one I, I talked about earlier, the unique parent-child process. Uh, more complex searches that require multiple hops, right? Or even some causal analysis, like we have here a, uh, a process that has talked to an external IP address, and then it created a file, and then it executed that file. Building that kind of rule in a log-based system is prohibitively difficult. Uh, you wouldn't reach for that kind of rule because you would know it would be painful. So my opinion is that this graph-based approach that we've sort of designed here is already strictly better than a log-based approach. I can take advantage of properties when I want to take advantage of properties. Um, and that's, that's great, that, that word.exe talking to evil.com, right? I'm, I'm thinking a lot about specifics there, but I can also track fundamental attacker behaviors. If an attacker has to worry about process executions being unique, you are changing how an attacker is going after your network. Of course, the truth is that we have to treat uh, that really nice crafted word uh, with a, an anomalous connection very differently than the uh, parent-child process anomaly, right? One of those is going to happen hopefully never, uh, but the parent-child process one could happen fairly often in your environment. And so for this reason, we introduce a concept of risk, right? Now I'm essentially labeling the, the master graph saying these small pieces here are very risky and these other pieces here are not that risky, right? So again, uh, this is a, a nice improvement. This fits more with my mental model of how I want to track attacker behaviors and make their life harder. Still, there's one more level that we kind of want to get to. Uh, as an example, what if it happens to be the case that Word talked to a non-whitelisted domain and also Word has a unique parent-child relationship? I don't want to have to write a whole new signature for that. I already have two signatures here, right? I want those to just automatically compose together so for this reason, Grapple has a concept of an asset uh, lens or a username lens. Uh, these, these lens nodes allow you to view uh, otherwise isolated risks uh, under a, a specific concept like a username or computer. So here we can see that all of these independent risks uh, that I had uh, started tracking actually overlap. And I can take that overlap into account when I'm describing the asset lens risk itself, right? I can say that this specific computer uh, is not just the sum of the risks under it, but also add a, a multiplier, like an extra 10% for every node that overlaps, right? Because that's extra sketchy when these things are, are overlapping. So the actual implementation of this is going to be in Python. That's the language that you would use to write these analyzers. I chose Python for a number of reasons. Uh, my experience with query language and, and domain-specific languages that uh, are very common in the state-of-the-art systems is that they front load a lot of their power. Um, they're really uh, purpose-built for specific scenarios. And anytime you try to move into some other scenario, uh, they really start fighting back. You get uh, performance problems. You get huge, huge queries because you can't abstract things away. You compare that with something like Python. Python is an extremely general purpose language. I think it's probably fair to say that it's the language of choice for a large part of both the data science and the security communities. You can build out powerful abstractions, and you're never going to feel particularly limited by Python, in my opinion. So analyzers in Grapple are these flat Python files that you'll deploy. Um, these will get called on every single update to the master graph. So it, this is a, a real-time system. There's no uh, search query um, like periods or anything like that. Uh, it's just going to happen on every single update. This function will get called and passed in a client to talk to the master graph. Uh, you will get a node 
view. Node views are a concrete representation of some node that already exists in the graph. And then a sender, which we'll use to emit hits. So this analyzer here is going to look for suspicious executions of processes because their parent process is Word, right? We don't expect Word to be uh, creating sub-processes. So this process only involves, um, I'm sorry, this query only involves processes. So if it's not a process node, we're just going to ignore it. Like if this is a file node or a network node, this, it's not relevant to this signature. Uh, we'll create our process query. Uh, we will constrain it by saying that it has to have the name winword.exe. Uh, and it, it has to have some children, which we won't constrain, because there's, there's no whitelisting here to do. Any child process is going to be suspicious to me, and I want to track it. I'll then call query first and pass it the client. And I also pass it the node key for the node that was passed into us, for the node that was just recently updated. That's really important, because that allows this query to execute in constant time. So you might be thinking, this graph is going to have you know, billions and billions of nodes, and this analyzer is going to get executed over and over again uh, you know, hundreds of times in, in a, a minute easily. Um, but it's always going to execute in the exact same amount of time, or, or roughly speaking, because it's a constant time operation. Uh, you're going to notice that that's a trend in operations in Grapple. They will always be constant time whenever possible. The reality is that we collect more and more data every single year. It's um, even just having linear uh, access times, it's not going to scale to next year when I've doubled the amount of volume, right? So if we get a response back, uh, we will emit the execution hit. I'll give it a name. I'll give it a risk score, and I'll say what that, uh, the, the concrete node was that I'm considering to be sketchy, right? So I pass in P. And uh, you know, this, is, this is pretty bad, so give it a risk score, score of uh, 90, right? Uh, one example of how Python is able to provide us with these powerful abstractions is that uh, we can leverage this parent-child counter that uh, Grapple provides. This is just a specialized interface. It's going to encapsulate all of this nice logic for us and just expose a single method called get count for. We don't have to worry about how this works under the hood. There's actually a lot to it. For example, there's actually a Redis connection uh, for this parent-child counter. So in the vast majority of cases, because of the constrained API, uh, we actually don't even have to talk to the graph database to get these counts. This is just an example of how you can build really powerful, reusable constructs in a way that most sims are not going to allow you to. And so we can also build out these more complex queries. Here we have uh, a signature for processes uh, that have a binary file, where that binary file was created by what I'm calling an unpacker, something like 7-zip or WinRAR. Now here we've got a really uh, low risk score, right? I'm calling this 15. If you try to spend uh, your time whitelisting something like this, you're just going to waste hours or days. You're never going to whitelist something like this because new software uh, will be deployed and it's going to use this sort of approach. But it's still an interesting behavior that I want to track in my environment. So I can move away from thinking about whitelisting in black and white situations of good and evil and just say that, you know, let's track this. And if it correlates with something else, we get that nice multiplier because of lenses. Uh, and I don't have to waste my time, right? That's really important. I spend a lot of time on whitelisting searches that would just be better served if I could downgrade them. I think maybe the best part about leveraging tools like Python is that you get to benefit from best practices, standard practices, right? If you compare the number of people who are writing uh, you know, uh, Elasticsearch's query language or Splunk's query language to the number of people writing Python, it's orders of magnitude difference. If you start Googling how to write a unit test for Splunk, you're not going to get very nice results. You will find that it is entirely unsupported. Uh, compare that to Python. Your standard library, just import unit test. That's it, right? We can already start building out testing infrastructure. I can deploy this code to GitHub, which Grapple supports via Git hooks. Uh, I can add linters, code reviews. I can roll back and revert changes if they're broken, continuous integration, right? Uh, my opinion is that as an incident response team starts to scale, alert management is one of these problems that's going to start creeping up on you more and more. And you're going to say, I thought we had an alert for that. And it turns out that it was actually just broken the whole time. You didn't have tests for it. So this is a, a huge value add for actually managing the searches that you're creating. 
cool. I'm going to talk about uh, investigations. So log-based investigations usually start off with one or more logs and maybe a ticket that tells me why I should care about the information in this log, right? So here maybe uh, you know that that hash is just known to be bad for some reason. Uh, the way I usually start off an investigation like this, I'm going to take a look at the suspect process, see what it's done, uh, but I'm not going to spend too long on it. I'm immediately going to start tracing it backwards and find the root cause and see where this thing came from. So what I'll do is I'll open up a search window in my sim, say the last eight hours, right, somewhere around a business day, uh, and I'll pick a field to, to start looking over. So let's, let's look at the PID, right? I want to see what this process has done. And I'll get like tens or hundreds of logs back. Maybe I get too many and I have to spend some time cutting it down. But okay, I've got a, a general idea of what this thing is doing. It doesn't look great. Not an obvious false positive. Time to start tracing it backwards. Let's look at the parent PID. Uh, maybe I find that the parent PID is something like launch D or cron, right? It's legitimate. This is a dead end. The attacker has set this up to execute in a week or two weeks, right? So I'll start looking for that file. That's the only thing I can start pivoting off of. I'll search for the file's hash, right? And I don't get anything back. Not great, but okay, there are a lot of reasons why that might happen. I'll try the image name, but I'm still not getting anything. Clearly this file was dropped a long time ago. I'm not getting any new logs back. So what I have to do at this point is extend my search window back. And now you can see I've got some logs related to that image name, which is great, but I'm paying a very serious cost. These are linear searches at best, which means that if I extend my search window by uh, doubling it, let's say, every search from this point forward is now twice as slow. On top of that, and, and really much worse, is that I now have PID collisions. Uh, PID collisions, in my experience, for a client laptop, if they are running Chrome in particular, uh, are going to happen basically every couple of hours. If my investigation is going days, it is essentially a guarantee. PID collisions suck. They are really annoying to deal with. Uh, you have to start saying PID after this time, but not before this time, stuff like that. It's really painful, uh, and it's because logs don't have that strong sense of identity. So there's clearly a, a couple of other problems here. Um, one of the problems that's maybe a little harder to see is that I don't actually have a good idea for how I'm pivoting. I want to know more things about that file. Really, I just want to know what created it. But all I've got is this hash. And I'm just going to hope that that hash shows up somewhere in other logs. I don't know that I'm pivoting to the information that I want. And I don't know if it's on the other side. Switch tabs. Let's see what we got. Oh, wow, that's not good. Doo -doo -doo. Get a replay of the talk. Almost there. Oh, come on. Oh. All right, sorry, bear with me with exactly two minutes while uh, the speaker Wi Fi is not working uh, for me. And so I'm going to tether to my phone, uh, which will just take less than 30 seconds. I apologize. Tethering, mobile hotspot. Let's connect to the Wi-Fi. And reload. Cool. Not what I was hoping for. OK, that should do it. I, again, apologize for that. And it's going to be slow Wi-Fi at that, so. Uh, spoilers. Cool. OK. So that didn't take too long. Uh, Grapple takes a completely different approach to investigations from this. Uh, at the heart of Grapple's investigation process is the Jupyter Notebook. In this room, maybe some people are familiar with that. Essentially, it's this uh, Python environment that you can interact with in your browser. Uh, you can do all these crazy things. You can split your Python code up into these cells. You can inline markdown, uh, upload images, um, replay different cells. Uh, it's a really powerful tool. And importantly, it is the tool that uh, the data science community has been leveraging for years. My opinion is that uh, the detection and response field has a lot of intersections with the data science field. We do a lot of the same work. We're all just trying to hunt through data to find something that looks like signal, right? So we should be paying attention to what that looks like here. Oh, man, wrong tab. Killing me. Start presenting. Yes. Cool. Okay. 
so Grapple has a sort of two browser pane user experience. Uh, on one pane, you will have a live updating view of your engagement. The engagement graph that you see here uh, just contains two nodes. One represents the engagement and metadata around it. The other is this svchost.exe. As I mentioned earlier, we don't have to comb through hundreds of logs. I can see every unique piece of information about that SVC host right there at the bottom. It's all in one place for me. At the bottom of the screen, you can see sort of an excerpt from a Jupyter notebook where I actually instantiated this engagement called demo. And then I pulled in a node based on its process, uh, its, its uh, node key, right? I can't really show both panes at once very easily. Uh, so I'm going to show you the engagement and then the graph. Uh, essentially, we're going to kick this thing off. I'm going to do exactly the same workflow as before. I want to understand what a process has done. One of the most important things to me is what children processes has it executed. So I'll say, uh, get the children for this process, and I'll just you know print out their process names. And I can see command.exe three times. So this thing is shelling out to some sub processes through command. Obviously, really sketchy. Again, this is a constant time operation. It doesn't matter how much data is involved. It doesn't matter if command.exe was executed months or a year later. Uh, constant time lookups for these edges. All of these get underscore methods are also causing that uh, live updating graph view to pull in those new nodes, uh, which you'll see in a moment. So let's keep going. Let's trace this process backwards. I'll go up its process tree. We can see its parent is command.exe, uh, which you would see in the graph. And there's a, a grandparent process, which is called dropper.exe. And we can keep going. And eventually, we'll see that the user downloaded this dropper.exe uh, from Chrome. This is what the graph ends up looking like. And it's a pretty nice story, right? We can say that the user executed Chrome from Explorer. Uh, Chrome uh, executed this dropper process. Uh, we've got dropper shelling out to SVC host, and then SVC host shelling out to these other command.exe. And this is what it looks like, right? So as you're typing in the commands on the right side, you're going to see all of those nodes automatically just get pulled in on the left side. So we've solved a lot of those problems that we talked about with the logging system, right? I'm not fighting my data anymore. I don't have to worry how much data is there because it's all constant time operations. There's no search windows, right? Before, I really wanted to keep my search windows small so that my queries would run fast. But I also wanted my search window to be as large as possible so that I could search over the most relevant data. Here, that's, that's a non-issue. We don't even think about search windows. I have identity, so I don't have to look at multiple logs or nodes. I just look in one place, and I can see all the unique relevant information. And I have my pivot points. If I want the children, I just ask for the children. I say, get children. right? I don't have to search for the child PIDs or anything like that and hope that I get the information back. So that's all the, the sort of graph stuff for Grapple. Um, that's the detection and the response and the identification of it. There is also another important word with Grapple, and that is that it is a platform. Uh, Grapple does not intend to solve every single problem on its own. That would be silly. Instead, it is built to be very modular and extendable, and it actually provides a plugin system on top of that. Everything in Grapple works through uh, event submission uh, or, or receiving. So you have these AWS lambdas. Those are just serverless compute functions. They get triggered every time something is uploaded to specific uh, AWS S3 buckets. That's just a storage interface. Uh, and they can read and write to these buckets and evit, uh, emit new events. Right? So it's very easy to extend, because if I want to add, say, a custom parser, all I have to do is subscribe to the right event stream. Grapple provides a plugin system for this. Uh, the plugin system is still in early stages, uh, but this is fairly representative. It'll only get better from here. Um, there are three main components to building a plugin for a net new source type. Uh, in this case, I'm going to walk you through what it looks like to set it up for uh, AWS Guard Duty. That's an Amazon offering where you pay them money, and they send you logs to tell you when something bad is happening in your environment. So we're going to build a, a subgraph generator. It's going to parse logs and turn them into graphs. That's what you see here. We're going to build that, uh, that query construct, like we saw that process query. right? We want to be able to build analyzers around these EC2 instances and guard duty alerts, uh, as well as a view construct so that we can represent the concrete uh, nodes in that graph. Uh, the first component is going to be built in Rust. 
the other two are built in Python. I do not expect anyone to be particularly Rust savvy. Uh, this is just pretty simple code. It's mostly boilerplate and the macros are gonna take care of a lot of it. So, uh, so what we're gonna do here is just focus on this AWS EC2 instance. You can see at the top here, I'm just gonna put whatever properties exist in the node uh, for this. You can see there's an ARN, that's the AWS resource name. It uniquely identifies that resource every EC2 instance or IAM user. Anything in AWS always has a strictly unique identifier. We also have a launch time, and there's all these other properties that I've omitted here just for screen space. I've added a macro that is not showing up super well on there, gray on gray, uh, but essentially what we're saying here is turn this structure into a dynamic node, right? That dynamic node is a construct that Grapple knows how to understand, and we'll identify that node using a static strategy. So earlier you saw the session-based strategy. Uh, static strategies are even easier. It's just a lookup. We can say the ARN maps exactly to its uh, canonical ID, right? That macro is gonna generate two things for us. One is the dynamic node uh, version of that structure, so it'll be AWS EC2 instance node, and then an interface for that structure. Implementing that interface is pretty trivial. It is one method, and it is always the same exact code, and that's gonna basically allow Grapple to do all these things on top of that node. Everything from here is pretty simple. Uh, we get logs, we parse them using a standard JSON parsing library. We get a structure out. We create our node, we just instantiate it by calling new. Uh, we're going to pass in that static strategy method that's generated by the macro, so you don't have to implement that or anything. And at this point, we just populate that node with information. We'll set the ARN, uh, we'll set the launch time, we put it into a graph description concept uh, or construct, uh, and, and that's it. This is all the code that's necessary. Uh, my opinion is that if you do this once, it'll be really easy to do it a second time. You'll probably run into a couple of things, just not necessarily knowing Rust very well, uh, but it's, it's really quite simple once you know what you're doing. Everything from here is going to be in Python, uh, and it'll be even easier. This is the EC2 instance query. You saw the process query earlier, right? This is how our analyzers are going to start looking for sketchy patterns that have EC2 instances in them. Really, technically, the only thing you have to do is write this code here. It's just a constructor. We're going to inherit from the dynamic node query, and it'll provide all of these interfaces under the hood for us. But so that we can provide a kind of prettier API. We'll wrap those internal interfaces with ones that have nicer names like uh, with launch time or with instance ID, right? But that is it. This is all the code you need to start building analyzers at this point. So views are what we use in engagements and are what we actually consume from uh, the analyzers when something is updated. So we'll create a, a view construct for this AWS EC2 instance. It's really quite simple. We have a constructor that has to take a couple of values, the dgraph client, which is the graph database that the master graph uses, uh, a node key, a UID, uh, and then just whatever properties uh, our node has. Uh, pretty simple, just construct that um, your, your super class. Uh, and again, mostly we're gonna be adding helper classes, but there are two methods that we have to go uh, and implement here. Pretty simple, everything is just a mapping of field name to type. So launch time is an integer, um, arn is a string. That's it, uh, because the Python code doesn't know the schema of the graph database, you kind of have to create these mappings for it. Same thing for the edge types. Uh, there are reverse edges denoted by tildes, so AWS EC2 instances have no forward edges, but they do have reverse edges, like all the guard duty alerts that they are a part of, right? So we say, uh, for any finding resource reverse edge, uh, there can be many guard duty alert views because we might be a part of multiple uh, alerts. Uh, and when we, from an EC2 instance perspective, talk about those alerts, uh, we call them guard duty findings, right? So it's sort of the, the mapping of a reverse edge to a forward edge and saying what the type is. Uh, and again, we, we will add these helper methods. So, this is all pretty simple. These are all of the constructs that you technically need to implement a plugin in Grapple. Uh, this is still a work in progress. I'm hoping to cut some of this down and provide some more intuitive interfaces, but um, really not much work. I built this guard duty plugin, which included users and, and alerts and all these other things. I think it was less than an hour and I was building the system as I was doing it, so it was, it's pretty, pretty quick. There is only one more piece here 
And that's the actual deployment. Technically, you can deploy this however you want, as long as it goes into EC2. Uh, but Grapple provides a construct to the Amazon Cloud Development Kit. So that's an infrastructure as code uh, group of libraries and, and things like that. Grapple provides a library in TypeScript. It'll be in Python soon, but Python was not supported when I started building this. Uh, pretty simple, we'll use the event emitter construct. We're going to create a new event emitter for guard duty logs. So AWS will just ship those off into an S3 bucket, and this will set up all the events and notifications. A service construct, uh, that's going to set up our AWS Lambda, which will actually run the subgraph generator. And we'll set up a, an integration with the output bucket, the place we're going to emit new events to, in this case, the unidentified subgraph bucket. And that's it. You can run uh, deploy, CDK deploy. All of your code is going to go up there. It'll all be managed by AWS. Really nice and easy. Setting up Grapple is uh, intended to be as easy as possible. Uh, if you clone the repo and you go to the grapple-cdk folder, you can fill out a .env file. Uh, there is one field in that file, and it is a bucket prefix. Just use an org name, anything that's like not uh, going to be taken by somebody else. It just has to be unique. And run the deploy all script, and that's it. It'll take about 15 minutes, uh, but you don't have to sit there and even hit yes. It'll just take its time and set up those resources. At this point, once you've run this script, uh, the lambdas are all set up, the graph database is set up, uh, everything needed for identification, the S3 buckets, the user interface that we saw earlier for engagements. Uh, that's it, right? So about 15 minutes, couple of commands. There is one last thing that has to be done. We're going to provision the schemas for that graph database so that <coughs> Grapple knows how to talk to it properly. For this, we can go to our AWS console, uh, select SageMaker. We can just pick the notebook that Grapple has already created for us right down there. At this point, either create a new notebook, or you can just use the one that's provided by Grapple. Run this notebook. It's going to provision everything and at this point, you're done. Send up some test data, which is also part of the repo. These are sysmon logs. You can see that dropper.exe and the malicious SVC host. You can investigate those, check out what the uh, network traffic was, right? Dropper.exe pulled that file from somewhere. You can figure out uh, from where. You can look at the, uh, the child processes and see what those are doing. And just you know, perform your own investigations. Cool. So I, I believe I should have time for questions, because I went as quick as I possibly could. Uh, but like I said, Grapple's open source. If you're interested in contributing, interested in using it, feel free to hit me up. Always happy to talk to people about it. Cool. cool. Yeah. Nice job. A um, couple questions. So how do you think about uh, recursive state? So for example, if you look at those EC2 instances, network firewall rules might be on, off, on, off, changed. How do you guys think about that? And then second question is two entities, multiple edges, because there can be multiple relationships between them. How do you guys yeah. think about that? Yeah, yeah, those are both really good questions. Um, I would say that by far the hardest things I deal with with Grapple are modeling questions like that because they have really big implications for the workflows and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to answer your second question first because it's a little easier. Uh, what that comes down to is just a decision. So as an example, right now, Grapple uh, does not have a concept of like writing to a file multiple times, right? That's going to change by having an intermediary node called like a, a write node, which will store all of the metadata in multiple times for every single write. That's usually the, the abstraction you want. And then the, the query interface can abstract over that uh, very, very easily. It's really just a, a question of whether you want to differentiate those different writes and that sort of thing. Um, which has come up a lot of the time with, with Grapple. Uh, connections are another good example. The way connections exist in Grapple is you have a process with an outbound connection, which has an edge to an inbound connection, which has an edge to a process, right? So there's, there's these intermediary nodes that we can hold that information in. Uh, so really just a, a matter of making that call. As for uh, recursive systems, um, I'm not sure I fully understand exactly what you're asking. Maybe if, if you could clarify, I, I think I kind of understand the, the IP question. So, so it's not as much about recursive systems. It's about successive state changes. So if you think ah. about 
a, something like a firewall rule. Typically what right. happens in a vulnerability gets set, gets open, gets closed. That time sequence, it's not clear how that's represented because it's the same state being changed multiple times on the same entity. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, a really good question. And again, one of the tougher modeling questions that I've run into. Um, state changes are something you, you can abstract away by saying, like, here's a node representing the firewall rule from this time to this time, and another node uh, with this new firewall rule, right? So if you wanted to expose that for something like a firewall rule, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and you could build that into your EC2 plugin. Um, do, you have a, are you, do you have a clarifying? I was just going to say, in both those cases, those somewhat permute the constant time uh, calculation piece, right? Because those grow linearly or exponentially based on the number of connections or state, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So let's say your firewall changed like 100 times, right? Then you have to perform 100 edge expansions. The good news is that edge expansions are extremely efficient, uh, and hopefully your firewall isn't changing like millions of times. But yeah, totally, totally reasonable thing there. Um, one thing that I've thought about, the, the nice thing about being in AWS and about being a platform is that we're not constrained to the, the graph database even, right? If I wanted to, I could have a DynamoDB table that just tracks firewall state uh, for everything, and then the analyzer would write to that table and then query the table and say, like, okay, summarize this information. Has it changed for this port, right? So in theory, if you wanted to solve that problem, there's, there's nothing stopping you from just setting up a new system. In terms of representing it in the graph, it's a hard call to make. It really depends. For a firewall, I might be inclined to put that into the graph because I don't expect tons and tons of changes. For something else, you know, graphs are awesome for, for a huge amount of these workloads. I think they're a great like native fit for most cases. But if something doesn't fit into it, set up another database. Put your data in there, right? Optimize for the for the workload you're looking to solve. Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. And course, for open sourcing it. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, I don't know to what extent you have used this or deployed this uh, at scale and relied on it, uh, but sort of the fundamental, basically the Splunk problem that everybody's got is sort <laughs> of the, the volume of logs that you've got to deal with. And uh, it sounds like, to some extent, you know, you're getting rid of a bit of the redundancies that you would deal with, with all these like tons of logs revolving around the same thing. Yeah. Do you have a sense of sort of the storage efficiency that you can reach by having sort of everything already identified, codified into this graph database versus holding on to all the logs that you would over a month, two months, three months for an entire fleet? Yeah, yeah, th that's, that's a good question. So um, in terms of scalability, it's, it's kind of variable, right? So the logs that I work with at home are going to be Sysmon logs. And Sysmon logs, just in, they have so much redundant information. Um, I have something like uh, 60 megabytes of Sysmon logs. I run tests with it, it tears through those in seconds, that's, that's nothing. Um, and the, the actual storage property is about an order of magnitude less than that in terms of the data that Grapple actually has to hold on to. Um, that should scale really well as you add more and more redundant data, but it's going to be super workload dependent, right? So if you have, um, I think the good news is that for the systems that are the worst offenders for something like Splunk, they're actually the best case for Grapple. So uh, an extremely noisy process that's doing tons and tons of things, uh, that's Grapple's best case because very few of those things will actually be unique in terms of the logs. Uh, for systems where it's like tons and tons of unique different processes and files executing, it will certainly be no worse than Splunk. Um, it's worst case is linear scaling. So yeah, it's, it's hard to give a, a good metric there because it's so use case dependent. Uh, the system itself has a, a huge factor on it. Uh, the log type has a huge factor on it. So it's, it's hard to really answer that directly. Yeah, but it, it is no worse than Splunk, certainly. And I, I have <laughs> felt those exact pains. <laughs> That's always the, the goal, yeah. <laughs> Oh, anything else? Do you see uh, standardization coming down the pike for like predicate names, types, or like RDF namespaces as this concept gets more popular? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the biggest focus that I have been having over the last couple of months is getting to stability, API stability. That's actually why the plugin system exists, so that I can stabilize the core of Grapple, start moving other concepts into separate systems that can stabilize at their own pace. Uh, 
Uh, most of what you saw is entirely stable. Uh, so the query interface for processes should be stable. That's not an API guarantee yet, but I intend it to be very soon. Uh, the common information model that I'm using uh, is standard. It's, it's a, a little bit modified because I have all these edges and stuff like that. But for the most part, those properties are, are absolutely stable. Edge names, it's, it's subject to change at this point. Um, on top of that, I mentioned that I'll probably have these uh, sort of intermediary nodes to handle things like writes. Once that's out of the way, uh, which is probably a matter of weeks, um, I, I will be stabilizing it. And I'll make strict API guarantees. Yeah. But that's, it's a big focus right now. We good? We have another round of applause.